Hello uh, and welcome to the second webinar in our series of three. My name is Steve West from AHDB and today we'll be discussing strategic ways of reducing dairy costs and outputs. Uh, we've already had one technical glitch. I know some of you might have seen some of the slides to start with, um, but we're hoping not to have any more. So uh, please accept my apologies for that. Um, you will see in the chat section and subsequently in the YouTube section, uh, the link to last week's webinar, uh, which was aimed more at farmers experiencing the harshest of effects of the milk price challenge. Uh, today, we're talking more to those who've been encouraged to reduce their output. Uh, I'm joined today by a panel of speakers, um, Pierce Badnell from uh, LIC, who will be giving us some tips uh, on how to graze cows practically and identify key areas where we can reduce costs in our feeding regime. Tracy Towers uh, from Oak Hill Vets, who will give us words of caution about cutting the wrong type of costs, and she'll highlight the areas of cost uh, that are easily taken for granted and Oliver Hall from Andersons, uh, who will give us a, a real practical view on how we start to make plans for our business as we progress through this difficult time. So um, why are we considering ways of reducing costs? As most of you will know, the spot price is at an all-time low as a result of milk previously destined for the food service industry becoming homeless and causing milk price pressures on the industry. This follows from the lockdown situation as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The length of time that restrictions will apply is still unknown, but the consequence is likely to be sustained for many months regardless. We are in the midst of our annual spring flush, and I know many spring block carving, spring block carving herds will find reducing output at this time impossible. So I think it's important that we acknowledge that and would encourage you to ask questions relevant to your business with carving pattern in mind. We will try to make distinctions where practicalities are different. Um, each speaker will talk for 10 minutes and we will open up the panel for questions afterwards. Uh, we will we have around um, well, knocking on the door of 100 listeners today. Um, you can type your questions in the box on the right hand side and we'll answer as many as we can in today's webinar. But those we don't get to, we'll answer and publish those on the COVID section on the dairy area on the AHDB website. Rest assured, only we can see the questions and we'll not mention names when we ask them. So don't worry about asking anything you think is daft. Um, most likely others will want the answer to the same question. We won't be answering political questions today or anything specific to any particular milk buyers. Um, we'll take those on and if anything relevant, we, we can confirm the answers to those individual people. So uh, that's enough from me. Um, I'd like to move swiftly on and, and hand over to our first speaker. Uh, I know um, we may run into a couple of sound issues. Uh, we've, we've got speakers all over the country today. Um, if we do, we may need to go over one or two of the other points. So I'll, I'll hand over to Piers, our first speaker. Over to you, Piers. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for asking me to speak today. Um, the angle I'm going to take on this, this uh, discussion I've got here is about how to cut costs by incorporating grass into your systems. Um, my angle is really at those that may or may not graze. Um, and it's looking at the advantage of our resource, basically the grass, grass in our systems. It, I'm not here to talk about system change. I'm here to talk about cutting costs in these really rather brutal market conditions uh, and what can we do. And we, as um, we've been told, we've not got a great deal of time. So all the way through, I put sources of information, which I will come back to. And basically those sources of information are, are from Feeding Plus, Grass Plus and Forage for Larger, um, which are all put out by HDB. So I would urge you to, to take, a, take advantage of those. And I think the links that as I go through will be, will be coming up. So my first question, um, what is a grazing cow? Well. 
for this, I think you need to look at um, Chapter 7, Managing Your Feeding with, uh, from Feeding Plus from AHDB. Um, the principal pages are page 7.5 and 7.6. The calculations on, in, on feeding in terms of energy are very simple, the ones I'm talking about here. Um, so just as under my energy is the limitation, there's an example of um, how you would work out the maintenance requirement of a cow and, and how much energy she needs to produce milk. So first of all, in the sort of these high yielding herds, what is the grazing cow? Well, to me, the grazing cow is a cow that's 30 litres or less um, and, in, and in calf. Um, energy is the limitation. So this is, um, I'm not suggesting that we should be putting uh, 40, 50 litre high yielding cows out. Um, I would basically leave that to the nutrition nutritionists. And um, last week's um, um, webinar was a very good and um, I Richard spoke about that. So really, I'm looking at those uh, those 30 litres in calf cows. Uh, to me, those are grazing cows. So there's some fundamental things we need to get right, first of all. I put training, man and cow. And I'll tell you what, if a cow has not been or hasn't had to seriously graze and take quite a, quite a large point part of her nutrition from grass, it's going to be a shock to her if she's actually suddenly um, has to eat more. Uh, and what do I do? Where's, where's the trough, et cetera? But the key thing here, if I, if I ask, if I assess what's the hardest to train, man or cow, it's man. Cow, actually, once you, if you provide good quality grass in front of her and enough of it, she will adapt to it. So that's, that's a really quite a, a key thing here. The other bit of information, I'll just look at the bottom. So how much can these cows eat? Well, um, SIUC in Scotland, this is a number of years ago, um, did some work on late lactation whole sign cows in the autumn. How much would they actually eat? And they, they found on a dry day, she'd eat 15 kilos of dry matter. But on a wet day, she'd eat eight to 10. Now, we've got reasonably dry weather at the moment. We we're looking at the season, so we will have some wetter days. I think part of that lower um, consumption, at eight to 10 kilos, is, is more around that actually had that cow got buffer to come back into, was she used to grazing? But we certainly need to, uh, to be mindful of that. So most of my comp uh, discussion today, I've sort of based the grass dry matter intake around 15 kilos. A cow with good access to, to grass, um, where she's not um, buffer fed elsewhere, would eat 17 or 18 kilos. So I think that's fairly reasonable. The, the chart I've got here, I've, uh, actually, can we go back one, sorry, uh, back one? That's it, magic. The chart I've got here with litres down the side, the total energy required, and then basically I've been fairly generous with the concentration um, going in because what I'm trying to do is not start the cow of energy, and she needs that. And that, those calculations come from Feeding Plus on that chapter seven. So that's, that's my fundamental where I've come from. If you'd like to move on to the next, please. So if we take this cow and we put her out to grass, what? What's the result? Generally, when I speak to people who don't graze um, so much or grass is a very small part of their nutrition, um, what they're worried about is a loss of milk. Um, and people understand about, OK, the cow eats more grass um, and therefore I might, might save some feed costs. That's true. But the, the one thing that's hidden or not discussed a great deal is if a cow is inside a shed, and this is I'm talking about 24 hours, um, then she, there, there are housing costs. Now, if you see on the bottom there, it's got cost and it's got scraping, it's got bedding, et cetera, et cetera, going through the cost. Now, these costs I've got here and the feed cost eight to 12p and the housing cost one to three pounds. Um, I did those calculations a number of years ago. I've done them previously for individual people. Um, my key point here on this and all the way through is do your own cost. I've on purpose left that housing cost that the example there um, as out of date, that must be 10 years old. So the key point here is go away and work out what you're going to lose, what you're going to gain, so that actually you're actually making good decisions that has a positive effect on your business. Please don't take standard figures as, 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 the, as the key. Um, I am top 90% sure that you will, will improve um, and, and take, take cost out of your system and actually have a positive effect on your business by doing this, but work off your own figures. Just before we move on from this, I'm going to talk about this 30-20 bounce in a minute. But um, AHDB's dairy performance results have shown year on year the relationship between cost of production and profit is in the, in the round of about 80%. So what that's saying 
is that profit is uh, 80 uh, cost of production explains 80 percent of profit so this is a real business profit driver um, and this this is this is the background and the big data around this so we've talked about um i've talked about the cost of having a cow in a, in a shed so if i come to this 30 20 balance if a cow is not let's say buffer fed or has, has not been out to grass what happens when she goes out so if i've said it's a 30 liter she's now pd positive she goes out the general response that question is that actually she loses 10 litres of milk straight away and the reason being for th that she does is that um, she has got a complete she's going from one group of cows to another she's going to a different form of feeding etc etc she's got to find her place in the herd and so therefore some sort of argy bargy until she finds her place in the herd and so therefore that's driven by that drop from 30 liters to 20 is driven by change it's a driven by change in dry matter intake um well in those few days it takes her to adapt she'll probably eat less and hence her milk drops um and over three to three five four five six days she'll have to be a lower level and then she will come back now i put between 23 and 27 liters and in that i think most people will be in that sort of range a couple of people I've worked with have actually got back to near the 30, but um, I think for budgeting purpose, we'll go on that 23 to 25, 27 litres of range. So this is basically, um, I would urge you to work out your figures yourself, and so therefore we can work out and see, see what the gains you've got. Okay, next slide, please. Part of this is actually, actually trying to get more milk on grass getting more grass into the diet um, and actually beginning to get the cow to do the work. So not only is she feeding herself, she's actually walking around, spreading her own dung and urea, uh, uh, manure, etc., etc. So as I come into this picture, I'm going to come to the scenarios as, as the last point. The first one, I come back to this 30, 20 pounds. So when I'm talking to people and they say, well, I'll lose milk um, to try and get their, um, their attention and actually to get them really focused, I say, so what? Well, now I'm going to go through what I mean by so what and what are the scenarios. Now, to get a cow to, to graze and get to that 15 kilos of grass dry matter per day or, or slightly more if possible, um, what we need to do is we need to make sure she's concentrating on what we want her to do. And that means she has an edge of appetite that's not um, controlled starvation. If uh, anyone talks to you about grazing management as controlled starvation, walk away. They know nothing about grazing. What it, but what it is, is about that edge of appetite. If she's going out of the parlour to grass, that you can see she's, she's not distracted by everything else. She's out and her head goes down at grass, into grass and grazes for a couple of hours. So that's about edge of appetite. What absolutely trying to think of a polite way of putting it, um, knackers basically, that um, edge of appetite is if she's fed by the trough. So buffer feeding at grass with these cows, 30 litres and below is not necessary, unless you're short of grass or you're short of area. So that the, 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 the best scenario is actually, you break that um, addiction to the trough and actually so that she's focused on going out and grazing hard. I put some concentrate in that. Um, to um to to help with energy uh, and, and dry matter intake um, but fundamentally we want to try and avoid the trough if you don't have enough grass area um then maybe that the trough does have to come into it a little bit but we want to try and minimize that so we're talking about we're talking about money so let's just go through this scenario one so the cow goes out he does lose seven seven liters of milk and I will tell you these figures are out of date, so the concentrate is not the right price. Please work it out yourself. But if she loses seven litres and, and she what you were being paid 30p, that's two pounds ten you've lost. But she cost 88p a litre to feed her, so it's plus two pounds forty you've saved. You give her a bit of concentrate, that's cost you 72p. The housing cost was one pound fifty, so you've saved that. So therefore, you in net terms, you're better off about by just over a pound. Scenario two. She's lost a little bit less milk, but times a much lower value. Um, feed cost was slightly higher. Concentrate have been a bit more stingy. The housing cost was slightly higher. So that's plus 364. So those are the scenarios. Those are the things you need to go through. I would suggest that the cows will, will probably end up in the 23 to 27 litre range. Work your figures out and then take into account and work those housing costs. The, the feed costs actually saved is really easy to do. 
the housing cost takes a bit more um, to do. But it's a it's a key figure. Okay, thank you. Now the next slide, please. So I've, I've talked a bit about the money. Now a bit more about how we're going to make this happen. Well, just on the top here, we've got forage for knowledge. Forage for knowledge is something that AHDB put out every week, and it captures you know, grass growth data and grass quality data from all around the country. And this the top of the slide is basically from last last week, uh, the 16th. Uh, and it's looking at this, um, the growth rate. We can see that as 50, 51 kilos of growth per day. So that's a 51 kilos of dry, grass dry matter growing per hectare every day. And that's an average of all the growth rates. Uh, the grass dry matter, we've had some really dry weather. That's been that's coming in at 22.8 there as an average. The range there will be 20 to 25 at the moment, somewhere in the region. And grass ME, well over 12 ME, and a crude protein of 19.9. Uh, so grass is not a limiting. Uh, not a limiting feed, it's a very good value feed. If you take that, if you were having to buy that as a product in, you'd have to pay uh, quite a reasonable amount of money. Now, usually if I'm talking to people about how to get most out of grass, um, which, um, it, it does take some it, longer than I've got at this moment. So the fundamental of what I'm talking about is rotational grazing management, it's rotational management. Oh, work we we lost you for about a few seconds there Piers. okay well, what was the last bit you heard uh it, it, well if you were to go back uh, you, you were just talking about grazing management okay so i'll come back in what i'm talking about is rotational uh, grazing management um rotational set stocking does not work um the the benefits of what i'm talking about come from rotational grazing if you don't have a plate meter i would normally suggest uh, people have a plate meter so you've got accurate figures but I'm aware that if this is a, a radical change for you uh, and, and what I'm talking about that actually there may not be the money or the time to get a plate meter so if we look at the bottom left we're sort of going in at that that's a 3,000 cover which comes up halfway up the shin and, and what we are trying to achieve is the next the picture on the right is get the cows to graze down now that is a, what we call a residual that's about three and a half to four centimeters 1500 on the plate meter that is tight cows that aren't used to grazing are very unlikely to get down that tight but what we're trying to do is get as tight as we can there you are in an advantage at the moment it's dry weather which makes it easier for the cow so the top look the top um, graph we've got the grass growth rate so there's um, 2018 and there's 2019. On my next slide, we'll go through um, the management of that. Next slide, please. So but on the bottom, we've got the, the rotational, um, we've got the grass curve for the, for the season. And I'm trying to pitch this has been quite difficult. I've gone for a very, very basic and reasonably crude approach to this. So I, what I'm saying is 20 to 25 days to get round from, so the paddock you graze today, you should go around the rest of the paddocks and be back in that paddock in 20 to 25 days. Fundamentally, that rotation length is set by the grass growth rate. So if you don't have a plate meter and you don't do it yourself, follow the forage for knowledge that they're given for the growth rate. So if you've got a growth rate of 50 um, to get from 1,500, four centimetres to 3,000, will take you about 30 days. If it's growing at 70, that's 21 days. And if we look at the bottom, uh, bottom grass growth curve, fundamentally from now till about August, if we ignore 2018, um, the, the average growth there is about 60. So that's a, a reasonable level to set. So. Uh, uh, nice round numbers in 100 cows. Um, if we have 100 cows and we want them to eat 15 kilos of grass a day, that means every day they need to eat 1,500 kilos of dry matter, grass dry matter. So that's the demand per day. So if we have one hectare of grass and we put the cows in at about 3,000 kilos of dry matter, uh, which is a, a, the picture, previous picture, sort of halfway up your shin, um, and we are able to get them to 1,500. That means in that hectare, they will have eaten 1,500 kilos of dry matter, so which will work out at 15 kilos a day. So if we are sticking at a 25 day round, which is almost halfway through what I said, um, a halfway point between the two growth rates there, 25 days, 
um, our 25 day round with a hectare a day is 25 hectares needed. Now, this might cause problems. Maybe you haven't got grass that's available, that amount of grass available. And when we were talking earlier about buffer feeding, then maybe if in this situation, if you had 100 cows and you wanted to do this, um, and actually you only had 15 hectares available, um, then maybe we well, have to put some, some buffer in there, but we want to try and avoid it as we can. This 25, uh, 100 cows on 25 hectares works out about four cows a hectare, and that actually is 60 kilos of demand per hectare. So what that's saying, with four cows a hectare, and they're eating 15 kilos, every hectare each day has to provide 60 kilos. And if we match that to the, the grass growth curve on the bottom there, that 60 will take you roughly through the midline through on 2017 uh, land um, previous year 219 year all the way through till sometime in August. So the, I, what I would suggest is you match this date, you match this growth to or, or what look out on forage for knowledge. There's uh, grass sampling and measuring from all around the country that will give you an idea of what your grass growth is. Um, one of the other key things is there's a lot of data there's a lot of information i've gone through here in a very short period of time but there are resources you can use as i've mentioned that ahdb have got and i think the other thing that's really important if this is new to you talk to your neighbors see what your other neighbors are doing talk to people who are grazing you will get fantastic information from those people um, there's money to be made there's certainly uh, cost to be taken out of the system what we just have to do is look think laterally and use this use the opportunity we have and the one beauty about um uh, uh rye grass is the harder you make it work the better it, it will be. and finally just on that but we do need to let it recover we look at the post grazing it takes till the second leaf is back up for the plant to recover the third leaf has 45 percent of the plant's yield so what we want to be trying to do is grazing that plant at two and a half to three leaves. So if you don't have a plate meter, if you don't have a neighbor who's a, who's, who is grazing um, and who could impart some knowledge to you, then count the leaves and then that will help you. And I think that's that's enough for me. That's probably my time up. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pierce. Um, and uh, yeah, really good um, sort of very, uh, Good overview, really, on 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 how to just get a, a simple way to get some cows out to grass. So so thank you for that. Um, we'll move straight on to Tracy, if that's all right. Please keep your questions coming in. We'll, we're saving those up, and we will ask those um, after all the speakers have spoken. So over to you, Tracy. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Um, yeah, thank you, Piers. That was a great talk, uh, and obviously focusing on those cows um, that are less than thirty litres and already pregnant. And I think that's a really important point that you make, because uh, one of our concerns as vets is uh, how we manage those freshly calved, high-yielding, uh, very vulnerable girls that are not yet back in calf. And obviously, a mismatch in energy supply here uh, will end up with more problems than we started. Um, not least uh, future fertility, which will obviously impact on their uh, future yields um, and um, efficiency. So yeah, so I'm uh, one of 11 vets that are uh, practicing in Lancashire, and we look after sort of 104 in the region of 140 dairy farms. Um, and I've been speaking to a few of them this last week who have been challenged with reducing their output by three percent. Um, and the general feeling uh, very much seems very understanding and quite understandably annoyed, um, but also more worried about uh, the, further the further restrictions uh, that may happen as the spring progresses. And I think this is where uh, discussions like this come into play uh, in order for us to, to plan the best road ahead for your individual farm. Um, interesting, I think we could maybe have learned some things already from this. Um, I was talking to two farms uh, this week. One was a robot farm, uh, dried off uh, his next batch of cows and sent five down the road. And what happened? His milk went up. Um, similarly, uh, drove an hour down the road, spoke to the next farmer, um, 500 cow herd, did exactly the same, sent some calls, dried the next batch up, uh, next batch off. His milk went up, um, and I thought, you know, how interesting that in both of these um, these examples, uh, is there an argument to say that stocking density on both of those units uh, was ordinarily limiting production? And so, if we look at it broadly, if is more milk with less cost uh, particularly a problem? Um, so, 
maybe we can take some things that we learn from this experience uh, forward with us. And finally, um, cutting corners with those proactive herd health decisions that we thought were a great idea before um, the, the coronavirus is not a good idea because what might seem a small saving now may be a potentially huge cost later and we're going to touch on that in a, in a later slide. So one of the things that many of you have probably already done is uh, dry off some more cows and I wanted just to spend a little bit of time talking about that. So my concern is uh, not to go too far with this. You know, we don't want too many cows with really, really long dry periods and therefore risking some of these girls getting fat. Um, and I don't mean from the outside, um, I mean internal fat. Um, quite often when we operate on twisted stomachs, um, the cow looks a great body condition score from the outside, 2.5, uh, maybe even three, but dreadful on the inside. And these cows are usually the ones that have had the long dry periods where they've been laying down internal fat. And they're the girls that are going, going to risk a poor and therefore cost of transition. You know, have you got actually the facility to cope with the numbers of dry cows uh, that you're proposing? The worst thing that we could do with these girls is restrict feed space uh, in that vital three weeks pre-carving um, because that's going to have consequences on the entire group, not just the extra girls and not least infertility in that next lactation, amongst other things. There's huge limitations to uh, managing your dry cows as one group if you've got such varying dry period length because it's absolutely impossible to know uh, what the dry matter intake is, uh, because obviously an average becomes increasingly unreliable. So what I would urge you to think, is your group now big enough to manage as two groups? Obviously, we've got the benefit of the far off groups needing a lower energy density ration, same dry matter, obviously, and which obviously could be cheaper uh, than the transition group, that three weeks pre-carving. For example, if you, are, if you are feeding dry cow rolls, you know, feeding these to girls outside of the three weeks pre-carving is not only going to cost you unnecessarily, but you're also at risk of uh, detrimentally affecting the, the far off's health in laying down more fat. So not only is it costing you, it's actually probably hindering you. So feeding as two groups actually allows you to gain more control over each cow's body condition score. Um, which therefore obviously makes for a better transition and avoiding the creation of costing, uh, costly tra transition problems further down the line. And obviously the nice, uh, the nice side effect there is it also allows you more control over your feed costs in that dry period. Um, yeah, this was just a, a sort of quick slide really on cull cows uh, as it was already mentioned in last week's webinar and i'm sure you've all already acted on those girls already on your cull list um anyway you know maybe we shouldn't be waiting till the end of lactation maybe we should be uh, thinking about getting rid of them sooner rather than later but my point was more should we be taking a step back and having a different look at which girls go on your cull list uh, and maybe sort of de decreasing the threshold um uh, after which you, you think about sending them. And I think this has to start um, with a, a herd inventory. This came from one of my colleagues, uh, Andy, in the practice. Uh, you know, how many cows and heifers do you have and how many are you going to need on the other side of this? Um, and that will give you the sort of rough starting point of how harsh you can be with this, uh, with a culling strategy. And do we need to think sort of very commercially? Um, and for example, do we need to start putting thresholds there you know if you're not in calf by a certain days in milk is that going to be a mark for your card uh, for potentially being culled now's not the time to be holding on to any cows um such as those repeat those repeatedly like mastitic cows or lame cows that we can't get right uh, or considering lengthy or costly treatments for sick cows uh, that are unlikely to ever reach that payback point. And the a really classic example would be that lame cow, perhaps she gets a twisted stomach. You know, maybe you usually operate, but now potentially now's the time, you know, is is she ever gonna, are you ever gonna get that money back from her? Or do we need to be being harsher and uh, considering uh, culling these girls?
Next slide, please, Steve. Yeah, um, so one thing I wanted to say was, yeah, don't, uh, when, when we're challenged with cutting costs, um, it's very easy to look at, right, what costs have I got this month? Can I do without any of them? And I would really urge you not to cut out any of the proactive herd health things that you thought were a great idea before. It might seem um, a quick way to save a few quid now, but it could really bite us down the line if we stop. And a really good example of this is BVD vaccination. So BVD vaccination, loads of people are doing it at this time of year. Um, and depending on which vaccine you use, it uh, costs between two and five pounds a head. Yet, if we were to have a hole in vaccination um, and therefore a hole in the immunity in the herd and BVD got in, then the cost could run up to sort of £90 per head when averaged out, and i.e. thousands of pounds per outbreak. So my point there is really, you know, don't skimp on the, the vaccine because the cost of the disease is phenomenally more. Um, yeah, other examples of, of my line of thinking here were, you know, your milk recording, you know, you could have been doing that for 10 years with that wealth of cell count data, etc. Um, you know, don't skimp on that for the next couple of months, because at the end of this, you will uh, want your productive and efficient herd back and you don't want the hole in that data um, and all the problems of being able to sort of fine tune as a result. Um, routine fertility visits, I'm obviously going to say that as a vet, um, but we spend, you know, most of our time trying to fine tune fertility on farms in order to promote efficiency. Um, and I think just not saving a you know a low amount now will have sort of catastrophic consequences when we look at the efficiency of fertility going forwards. Yeah, the next slide. Um, so yeah, I seem to have um, caught up on a bit of time. I've uh, sped through my slides um, and kept it quite short. Um, but yeah, it was just sort of to say that. Uh, there will be light at the end of the tunnel and we will come out of this um, and so it's all about thinking smart saving those costs and being there at the end of it um, and i'd like to um, acknowledge my colleagues in our oak hill farm back team particularly uh, suzanne bailey michael murphy and andy brammel who all um, had their input into this discussion so thank you Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tracy. We've, we've had quite a few questions through, so I'll, I'll definitely be coming to you after, at the end of the panel. So thank you very much. Um, okay. we'll, we'll move straight on to, uh, to Oliver, if that's OK. Uh, if I can get the slide to move on. There we go. Right. Uh, so Oliver's going to talk, talk a little bit about, about the business side um, and, and how you can plan forward. So over to you, Oliver. Hi, thanks, Steve. And good afternoon, everybody listening. Um, just my, well, my background is I'm a, one of the dairy business consultants at Anderson's, and I'm just going to take you through some simple step processes of how to approach uh, budgeting when you're faced with a, a falling income in your business. And then at the end, we're just going to look at some um, top tips for doing that and, and ways to keep on track once you've got a budget and, and maybe just have a little look towards the future and uh, see what lessons we can learn that will um, prepare us for the next time we're faced with such a challenge. So, okay, Steve, ready to go? So, first thing is when you're looking at budgeting your income drop is to, to really start out with, well, what do you want to achieve at the end of this trading period? Um, and ultimately, you might not have uh, much of a choice, but the holy grail in business would be to um, every year, uh, protect the balance sheet and grow the balance sheet or, or your net worth. Um, if you're unable to do that in this trading year, you should be really looking to protect profit as much as you can. So even if you um, make a certain level of profit, it might not be as much as what you need. So your balance sheet might go down in this year, but you're just looking to minimize that reduction. And then probably um, the least favorable option is when you are really under pressure and you're just looking at preserving cash flow. Um, and, and you might have to, in those circumstances, be looking at selling off assets to bring in cash to your business. So in this step process that I'm going to go through, you, you may have to double back and come back to the start again. If we get to the end and your outcome isn't what you want to achieve or it can't be achieved, then you have to go back to the start and, and maybe reassess uh, what your end result would be. But first of all is, is start with the end in mind. Um, 
So first bit then, or step two here is to actually sit down and work out what profit you require from your business. Um, and, and simply or reasonably simply for most people would be um, get your last year's accounts out or you might know these figures from uh, maybe get the last couple of bank statements out. Work out what you require as, as drawings. Um, this might be slightly different for those that have got limited companies and stuff like that. So you might be looking at director's salaries and dividends. But to keep it simple, in my example here, I'm looking to generate £50,000 drawings from this business. And that's that's everything, not just the cash that you may be taking out of the business and putting in your personal account, but it's 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 life insurance, it's pension contributions, um any other things that you may be paying for out of the business account that eventually get called drawings by the accountant so in my example that's fifty thousand um you then want to sit down and work out what you uh with with your present lending arrangements um what bank loan commitments you have so that's um really we're looking for the just the capital amount or the principal on the loan that you need to generate each year um if, if, if you're unsure, you could uh, maybe uh, look at your last set of accounts and see how much that bank loan has gone down by in a, in a trading year. That will be a, the amount. And you've also got to remember, if you looked at your bank statement and looked at the monthly or quarterly repayment on the loan, um, that would be the capital and interest. Um, it shouldn't take too long to split those out. Or if you want, you can actually just put all the capital interest into one lump sum. But you've just got to remember when you do your profit budget in the next step that you've already paid for the interest. Also probably need to work out what tax you do to pay. Um, this is often the challenge uh, when, when incomes drop is that you're paying tax from a previous financial year when times might have been better. So it, if you're unsure, maybe just ring up your accountant and say, look, I know I've not got my accounts in, but any idea what tax I might pay, just do, 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 do some quick sums. So in my example, I know I've got an £8,000 tax bill uh, normally paid in um, July and January for those with partnerships or September if you've got a limited company. Um, HP repayments, so you need to sit down and just work out any of those other monthly commitments, um, how much do they come to um, because they are normally after profit expenses. So in my example, that's 4,000. So I've sat down, I've worked out that this business needs to generate 82,000 pounds per year. Okay, so that is now my profit requirement that I'm going to carry forward to the next slide. So the next step then is to realistically sit down and estimate your income. Um, and I know this might seem challenging in the current climate. Um, it's quite hard to read what's going to happen in milk markets um, month to month. But what I would say is it's not about necessarily sitting down and being you know an amazing predictor of market conditions and milk price it's about putting a realistic sum in here first so i would take your milk price that you've got today um maybe go you know there's quite some useful things around um you know you could go speak to your milk buyer if you've got that sort of relationship you could go look at some of the futures markets and, and see what they're thinking about where milk price could go but it it's quite difficult to do that so what you do is you just put your best um guessing essentially um but but it doesn't matter if you don't get it right necessarily it, this is now the reference point so you know okay so all circumstances on a 25 p a litre milk price in my example is my line in the sand so if i through the year now look at my budget and i know i'm getting higher than a 25 p a litre milk price i know that i'm okay and the action i've taken we know okay if that if um, things drop below that 25p, then I know I knew what the outcomes were going to be at 25p. So it's a, quite easy to sit down and work out, well, actually, now I've got to do another reforecast and come up with some more plans if, if it drops below that. So it's more about just, OK, predicting where you might be. Uh, don't forget all those other incomes that you might have as a dairy farmer. It's not just the milk. So um, sit down and have a rough estimate at your cull and calf income. Um, depending on how you're farming, but you know, um, you may have other diversification. Uh, uh, you might have countryside stewardship schemes, BPS, put all that in. So in my example, I've sat down and realistically estimated on a, a 1.3 million litre output that I'm going to have 387,000 pounds of income into my business in the next year. What, what we do then, um, it, 
we, we call it doing a backward budget. So we actually say, look, we know we've, we've estimated the income we're going to get. We know the profit that we are targeting to make. So from the previous slide, 82,000, we take that away from the income and that gives me my target costs of, of 305,000 pounds. So if I want to achieve that profitability that I've set out in the first stop, I know I've got to get my costs down to 305,000 turn this into a pence per litre target. So in, in my example, that then comes out, I've got to get my costs to 24.3 pence per litre. And then you basically work, not just yet, Steve, you work through a budget and, and, you, and you try to achieve that level of income by spending these sums of money line by line. Okay. Now, if you, if you do all that bit of the exercise and you go, do you know what? I, I can't cut that. I can't cut that. I can't cut that. I can only get down to, say, 24p in terms of my costs. I'm 0.6p a litre out. If, step five, then, if you can't make this balance, you have a number of options here at the bottom now. So then you know, one, the amount of money you're looking for. OK, um, so the first thing is you go back and you say, can I lower that demand for profit? Is there anything I can do in terms of reducing my drawings? Maybe um, looking at my tax bill, uh, HMRC, it might be open to negotiation of timings of paying that. You, after that, you may be looking at, well, the, you know, I was due to pay my bank back 20,000 and I was due to pay back my HP provider 4,000. Can I ring them up and, and lower their expectations for my profit this year and say, look, can I take capital holidays? um and those sort of things so you you after that that would be your first point of call if you can't make it balanced if it's even more challenging than that you're then looking at can i enter private funds um can i have i got cash sat in other bits or assets outside of the farm that i you know if you choose to make that strategic decision to keep farming and you want to balance this uh, enter them into the farm you could look at selling um, assets on the farm. So we're now in these more drastic um, cash flow preserving measures. So you, you're almost looking at maybe selling off some stock, um, maybe selling off other assets uh, on the farm. And then also you may be actually about, you know what, I need to go to my lender and I need to borrow the balance. Okay. Now, I would say the trick here is, is, to, is to do all this first before you go to the bank. You know, if you turn up at the lender's door and say, um, I want to continue as normal, so I don't want to do anything about lowering my profit requirements and I'm not going to do any cost cutting and I've worked it all out, it's a hundred grand hole, can you lend me a hundred thousand? They're going to not look as that as favorably if you go to them with a plan that you've already worked through and you say, look, I've cut this, I've cut this, I've cut this, I've lowered my drawing slightly, but there's still a balance. Will you lend me the sum of money uh, that I need to fund this business even you know so you might have said look even if the capital repayments holiday is not enough you're asking for a sum of money to lend you and tide you over until you foresee trading continuing as normal and those incomes starting to come back up the challenge for for the lender and you is okay we agree we're going to lend you this sum of money they will be looking at your previous performance and making sure that you can then service this new debt because what what they don't want is, is businesses that have, end up with debt that is, is unserviceable, um, and that will be the challenge. Um, okay, so we'll go on to the next slide, Steve. Um, top tips then, just to when you sat there and, you, and, you, and you're doing this budget, um, there's a little bit of um, uh, understanding around. So if you're doing a profit and loss budget, you would enter depreciation. So that's the sum of money that you're offsetting every year to make uh, capital reinvestments normally in things like um, machinery and buildings and milking parlors and bulk tanks okay so on average that could be two to two and a half p a liter in a business so that is not necessarily a cash cost every year now some of it might already be used up for example in paying um, if you've previously replaced assets using uh, debt like higher purchase or bank loans Ultimately, some of the depreciation has to go towards paying that bank loan, but the bits you are in control of um, about delaying some of those reinvestments. So it's, it's um, you know, the the tractor or the load all might be due to be swapped this year, but you might actually look at it and go, well, the HP is going to run out um, at the end of June. 
we would normally swap it on our normal replacement cycle. Can we actually not swap it, keep it another year? Okay, we might incur some likely extra repair bills because it's an older machine of say four or five thousand pounds, but actually monthly repayments on a HP could be a thousand pounds a month on a load off. So actually it might be not the greatest thing for the balance sheet because eventually you'll have to go swap that load all and it will worth, be worth less in a year's time and you will have maybe spent £5,000 on renewing it. But actually, you've just gained £6,000 there in your cash flow. So it's about really thinking hard about those reinvestments. Um, avoid any valuation increases. So um, what you don't want to be doing when, when, when income is tight is um, growing valuations in livestock forage or stocks on your farm so ultimately the way out of those is to plan one not to have them if you have got them and you are rearing large amounts of necessarily surplus stock or stock that you, you know you had a you had a plan to increase your herd but the cash flow is tight it might be realistic to say do you know what we're going to sell those bullion heifers we're going to bring the cash in but not only going to bring the cash in we're going to stop spending on rearing them every month because we don't want to a livestock valuation increase the other one might be around forage you know i think it was mentioned last week's seminar you know if you have large amounts of forage stocks and somebody wants to buy that maize off you it might be the year just to bring the forage stocks down to a realistic level now i always have the drought of 2018 etched in my mind you know don't be too tight with it but if you do happen to be a business carrying a lot of surplus forage on your balance sheet every year it might be the time just to sell some Stocks on farm, I'm just talking about, you don't really want to be carrying, you know, too much stocks unless the supplier is going to give you credit for it. For example, they're happy to sell you fertilizers to take delivery early, but you're going to pay for it a bit later. What you don't want to be doing is having huge stocks on farms. It just uh, holds cash up um, in the business. I would say you, when you're starting with that blank sheet of paper and you're setting out to spend your 305,000 in my example business, enter your non-negotiables first. And I know a number of people have mentioned those today. Um, so put them in first. You know, we still want to be protecting those core assets that are going to go forward into the future. And in my mind, that's that's my cows. Um, that's my people in my business. And um, that is, you know, maybe some of the productive capacity of the farm. You know, I'm happy to maybe trim back on things that I know I can catch up on in later years. So liming, peas, K. Uh, maybe some farm repairs that could be delayed a year. So I'm happy to do stuff that I could catch up on, but not if it's hugely going to detriment uh, my, my cows and my people for the future. Um, the the other thing there would be you you might it might be worth just doing some quick benchmarking. So looking across your business and comparing it to some industry averages, what looks necessarily high that could be the easiest place to find any cost reductions. And ultimately, when you're trying to spend less, it's either price or usage of a product. OK, um, so we're, re we're equally looking to use, you know, 10 percent less of something or we're looking to get a price saving on it. And, and I also wouldn't be afraid to, you know, push suppliers in terms of ringing them up and saying um, times are really tight for me. Um, I might be making a yes or no decision on some maize inoculant. If you can give me a price reduction, I might put it in my budget. If you can't, I might cut it. Um, and so you, it might be a time to call on a few of those favors. Um, if, if, you can, if you can make your budget work and there's still some variables in it, I would be looking to lock them in. So um, th there is some deals um, around um, with you know, being able to buy, you know, fuel is very cheap at the moment. So if you could maybe lock into your business fuel at quite a cheap price that works in your budget, I'd be looking to do that. And also feed is very, um, so one thing driving it up at the minute, but also May stocks in the US and stuff like that is driving some feed prices down. So if you can lock in and lock these things into your budget, I would normally do that once you've got everything agreed. Ultimately, I think often you we walk around farms, it's, it's looking to eradicate waste. You know, I you really don't want to be wasting anything um, on a farm in a year like this. So look at those areas of your business where you think, you know what, have we been a bit wasteful there and, and just really tighten things up. Um, we'll just go on to the next slide, I think, Steve. So once you've uh, done that budget and I've got it agreed with everyone in your business and and I mean everyone in terms of all the partners and family perhaps in your business and even down to key members of staff because ultimately 
it's not just going to be you that's going to be responsible for some of these things you know so make sure you share it with everyone and, and then track it so you can show everyone where you are against that um you want to be building your budget on solid assumptions and 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 having a good once you've done this budget a good notes column down the right hand side often the notes are more important than the numbers because uh, it, it reminds you you might be looking back at this in six months time and you're like i can't remember how i said i was going to lower my um, machinery repair bill but if you've got some notes alongside it that says look the budget is to spend so much on the load or so much on the scraper tractor it'll help you re uh, remember why why you put those assumptions in and, and how to get them once you've got your yearly budget turn that into some monthly sums of money um, try not to be too lazy and just divide everything by 12 because often agricultural businesses are lumpy when they spend their money in the year so uh, easiest thing is probably to try and get a report printed off uh, maybe your accounts program broken down by months uh, for the previous year it'll give you a good idea of normally where you buy fertilizer when you pay the contractor all those sort of things um, try and match up your heading codes to your budget also either do your budget to the heading codes that you want it in your budget or if you do your budget make your business now have heading codes that run the same because there's nothing more frustrating when you're trying to track where you are against the budget than stuff being allocated in the wrong line uh, or not being correlated to the budget um ultimately the a bit like the milk price the budget might not be correct at the year end but the important point is that when you establish this budget now this is your reference point and you hang everything off that so it's you either up or down against that budget and and that gives you um easier to understand what's going to happen as you go through the year and turn those actual turn those budgets into actuals um keep it reasonably simple i i think you can budget a um a dairy business for a year on one page of a4 maybe two depending on the font size so you don't want loads of loads of heading codes that's hard to follow but you know one one yearly budget on two pieces of a4 and then maybe broken down into monthly sums it is what you're looking to achieve okay we'll go on to the next slide steve um now just lifting ourselves uh, back a bit and saying okay did you know what 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 can we learn um from you know periods of of, of challenging income uh, in an, in dairy businesses i would say what we see is ultimately good businesses um, maximize profits in the good times and they also minimize losses in the bad times and and low low costs of production pay every year just to demonstrate that we just put a graph up you know we've got two example businesses here one at a 26p cost of production one at a 28p cost of production and we've got a, a cyclical milk price here and when you start to color the areas in above and below the line you see that you know a low cost of production business enters back into profit earlier than the business that's running at a higher cost of production and so and also when the when the prices are high they make more money and and they put more strength into their balance sheet which gives them more options in the down cycle um, and also they lose less money in the down cycle so we probably have to accept um that you know farming um returns are cyclical in nature not every year is always the same um and and the way to sort of really stop and check where am i is to look at probably more than one year and what i'd be looking is either at my three or five year average cost of production and profits in my business and i'd be comparing them to to a three and five year average price that my business has received and i and then i'd want to say is that uh, on average on a three or five year basis can my business deliver what i need or what i want or what i think it should achieve okay um and and because often i guess we get called in to help businesses at critically bad times and it's and it it, it may not be the specific critical bad time that, that you know gets a business to a point where the lender won't lend to it again um it's more about actually the the previous five years when you, you didn't make enough money in the good times to be able to get you through the bad times okay so it, it's easy to make excuses about low milk prices and droughts and stuff like that but you've really got to benchmark yourself on a sort of five-year average um and, and and see where you are and be honest with yourself like what can i do in my business to improve this 
other things I would say is when you if, if you if you think back to that example previously, it is easier um, uh, to make decisions around uh, resilient cash flows if you've not got huge monthly commitments. And I think sometimes we're at danger in dairy businesses of we always have a monthly income. It's easy to sign up to a thousand pound a month um, HP sum for a new machine, and and I got a number of clients and I think it works a lot better if you can not always buy everything on monthly installments because when incomes drop you've really got nowhere to go because you're committed to um, those monthly installments or you're going to have to go and ask to delay some of those monthly installments so when you actually swapping assets with your out of cash flow every now and again you, it's your decision you know it's your decision whether the load only swap this year not Actually, I'm already committed to £12,000 this year uh, on the load all. Um, so that'd be a lesson I would have for the future. Um, just in terms of benchmarking then, Steve, on the last slide, we have put up um, some data from, uh, it's a bit old. Um, so it's the 2017-18 report. We haven't had time to put the 18-19 um, results on a graph form, but it it really, I'd be when you're doing that benchmarking, you want to plot yourself on this graph here and you want to say, OK, what system am I and where do I sit? Uh, you know, am I average? Am I the best? Am I uh, in the bottom 25 percent worst? Um, it's not ne it's necessarily then about maybe saying, well, what systems could I do on this farm and looking across the graph and saying, well, I could do that on this farm. Would that mean I could lower my cost of production? How good at it would I be? Um, and then just for reference, then at the bottom, that is the main differences um, in those systems. So, for example, in the all year round businesses, it is the difference between the herd replacement, the power machinery and the unpaid labour that drives whether you are normally uh, top, middle or average. And, and it's slightly different to some different systems. And, and I think for me, Steve, that's it. Perfect. No, thank you, Oliver. Um, and and yeah, I'll just reiterate that the new dairy performance report is out, and we will include the link in in the YouTube blurb um, that that uh, accompanies this. Uh, so thank you to all of you for um, your words today. Um, I, I'm going to cut straight to a couple of questions, if that's all right. Um, the first one is to Pierce. Um, if if uh, you're still there, yes. turned on. Yes. Yeah. That's so. Uh, the question is, um, it's about buffer feeding. Um, if we, if your cows have been grazing and you haven't got enough uh, space to graze the group of cows that you've got, um, as you mentioned, when's the best time to buffer feed? Best time of day. Um, okay. What we're trying to do, if we're trying to increase grass into the diet and, and encourage the cow to eat and uh, utilise post milking. The, the beauty of milking is that you've just taken milk and that has a hormonal response on that cow to eat and to drink. So that drive, that will then drive that um, edge of appetite, which is where we're trying to get to. So I'd suggest probably the best time to, if you if you were in that situation, having to buffer. It's about trying to minimise the amount because if she has too much, she'll go and lie down and won't graze. But probably before afternoon milking. The downside of that, you then could be said that actually she'll wait at the gate. But, you know, if, if there's a time, I think um, in that sort of slight compromise, that's pre-afternoon milking. But I would just make sure you have that edge of appetite post milking. That is not starving, but that is the is concentrated. It's a bit like if you started at four o'clock in the morning, you get home an hour late for breakfast. The one thing you want to do is eat and have a cup of tea. No, I see. No, lovely. Thank you. That answers that. Because um, th th that came a few times. But another question that's come a few times um, we've had, uh, I'll direct it Tracy, actually, if that's OK. Um, it's yeah. about um, if we're going to split up all these fields um, and we don't have enough water troughs, um, d you know, a cow is going to be able to manage for a few hours without water. Um, yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, well, there's a really short answer to that, and that is no. Um, because if we're wanting these cows to produce milk, obviously milk's made up largely uh, something like 87% water or something like that. Dairy cows 
absolutely need water, uh, arguably more than anything else. So no, we need to be getting some water to each of these fields, even if that's in sort of like some form of temporary sort of, you know, making a trough that we sort of take IBCs to daily just to sort of make sure they've got that fresh water available. Um, the cows have got a fantastic sense of smell, smell and they do care about what water they drink. So clean and fresh is, um, is obviously going to be very important. And if we're not able to give them sort of everything, you know, if, if, if we do think that they are not getting their full requirement whilst out at grass, we do need to make sure that we're compensating for that, say, uh, back in the collecting yards or after milking uh, when they're at their peak water requirements, really. Uh, so making sure we've got adequate trough space um, for at least, sort of, say, 10% of the herd to drink at one time, for example. Perfect. No, thank you, Tracy. And I'll, I'll ask you one last quick question. I know we, we're kind of going over time. Um, it's just about uh, cows physically getting out to the field. So um, in terms of lameness, um, it, is there anything we ought to really take a bit of care of um, from the lameness front if, we, if we're suddenly starting to graze cows? Tracy? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think cow tracks, uh, you know, you can never underestimate um, the surface that these girls have got to walk on or the distance to and from the parlour. Um, I think turning uh, cows out that are lame need to be in sort of local paddocks uh, with not, you know, not very far to go. Um, these farms that are very well set up for grazing are fantastic uh, cow tracks. And I think that sort of says how important it is, really. Um, otherwise, we're going to end up with a lot of white line disease. Um, and I think care and maintenance of those tracks and making sure they're not too stony, well drained, etc., is going to be paramount if we're going to make this work. Excellent. I, mean, I guess as a short term um, solution, you could potentially just, if you don't have tracks, you can just be picking up feet more, looking at them, just trying to maintain the feet and just make sure that uh, you, you can eliminate any uh, sort of quick problems. Yeah, uh, so I think, you know, mobility scoring uh, is, it comes back to one of those proactive things I mentioned in my report. Um, mobility scoring is actually easier whilst at grass because, of course, you can watch them walking in and out at their leisure. So that it's sort of now, now more than ever is going to be important if you're going to be turning out because mobility scoring allows you to pick up those cows at the earliest stage and therefore... Um, you, you, you know, targeting a very early treatment, which is going to be absolutely essential. Steve, can I just say something to add to that? Um, of course you can. One of the key things, uh, uh, if, you're, if you haven't got that, most farms have got some form of infrastructure um, to reduce lameness on suboptimal tracks or not perfect tracks, let the cows go at their own pace so they can see where they've yeah. been. The that, that if, if there's nothing else you do, it's that. Um, if you couldn't get a vibrating roller in, that will take some of those those sharp things out. Um, yes, so let them walk at their own pace. Yeah, I totally Lovely. agree with that, Piers. Brilliant. No, th thank you. Thank you both for that. I, I know we, we do have a long list of questions. I would like to have covered quite a few more of these, but um, there were so many good points in the presentations. I've let that run. Um, we're slightly over time, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to pull the discussion to a close there. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd just like to reiterate uh, that we're going to, we are going to answer those. They're going to be published all on our website afterwards. Um, next week, in the same time slot, that's 12 p.m., uh, we're going to be joined by Neil Adams from Promar. That's the 30th of April, um, and he's going to look at uh, some of the next steps that you need to take. So, uh, in Oliver's presentation, uh, he mentioned that it is actually quite difficult to to be a um, a mystic meg and, and look at really where you're going to be in the future and next week's webinar really is looking to to try and tackle some of that and answer some of that questions put a bit of certainty in um, so uh, please join us for that um, we'll have links to a series of resources uh, that were referenced by our speakers um, that will feature in the webinar description on the youtube channel uh, so if you're looking at this retrospectively look in the youtube channel feed and you'll see the links. Uh, I'd urge you all to go to the dairy section of www.ahdb.org.uk uh, and seek out both the market intelligence page uh, and the podcast page as both of those are going to be absolutely relevant to uh, the situation at the moment. Um, 
uh, both will signpost areas uh, and they'll certainly help you with your business. Uh, there's also, um, both Pierce and Oliver referenced the dairy performance report. Uh, the new version of that report, uh, my colleague Kate Parks has, has compiled, um, that's now available on the website and we'll make sure that there's a link uh, reference to that too. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to thank all of our speakers for their time today. Um, it really has been a useful insight. Um, and I'd really like to just thank you all for your attention uh, and for listening today uh, and to stay safe and get in touch. And until next week, goodbye.